Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. For my April 25th garden column, I wrote about using plant supports in the vegetable garden. You know, in addition to providing a vital role, which is to support plants and help them be more productive, plant supports can also add a bit of pizzazz to the vegetable garden. So I thought we'd talk about that today and I'll show you what we use. Now I wanted to start out with a photo that I took last year while perched precariously at the top of a ladder so that you could see what our garden looks like as the season is underway because I have to admit it looks pretty cool. Earlier this week we moved these two big arbors and so I wanted to show you that next. One of the supports we've used in our garden for the last couple growing seasons is this livestock panel arbor and it is the slickest thing ever. They're also referred to as cattle panels and they are about 54 inches tall if you were to stand them up and 16 feet long. So this arbor, which we're in the process of taking apart so we can move it to another bed, is made up of two livestock panels. So you can see for the moment they're a little bit cattywampus, but they have a lot of tension on them. And so prior to moving them, we need to use ratcheting tie downs to hold them together. Now we are going to move this far one first and what we need to do is remove the fence post so it's out of the way. And once this one has been moved, we'll borrow one of the tie downs and move it to here for the moving process. But I've used this to grow melons, small winter squash, small pumpkins like pie pumpkins, cucumbers. It's worked really well. It spans a pathway between two raised beds and it's just a fun way to support vining types of plants. Now one change we've made this year is to switch from those heavy duty metal fence posts to sticks of rebar. Bill had some that are 10 feet long and he's cut them in half to five foot lengths. This is going to look much nicer than those fence posts which were really hard to ignore. So I'm liking this a lot better. We've decided to pound three of them per side. Again, they're on the outside for stability so that it doesn't wobble one way or the other and it just takes a little bit of tension off of this arbor.
Now Bill is removing the tie downs. You can see just how much tension is on those hoops. My very favorite plant support for our garden is our bean arbor. And judging by what many of you have said when you've seen it in action, apparently it's your favorite too. But I've never showed it to you this way. So we move them out of the garden during the winter months and then now it's time for me to move them back in. But what I wanted to show you, and this illustrates it the best, is that it's made up of four individual trellises. We bought these 12 years ago, so it's been a while, from our local Fred Meyer store, which is a member of the Kroger chain, just in case you have one of those nearby. But it's been so long, so I can't guarantee you'll find something that is the same. But check out your local garden centers to see what they have or your local home centers because a lot of times in their garden centers they have different types of trellises. So again, these are four separate trellises that we put together to make an arbor. And they are about seven and a half feet tall, but they have spikes that we push into the ground. So that makes the top of the arbor about six and a half feet tall. They are 46 inches wide, and of course our pathways are 36, so we just arrange them on a raised bed so that they're five inches in from the edge of the two raised beds that it goes to. And they are 14 inches deep, so I have to space them a few inches apart so that this arbor will go down an eight foot long raised bed. The nice thing is that I don't need extra help to move these. Although it is a little bit awkward, but not too bad. So my usual routine is to just secure them in place for the moment and then I'll adjust the spacing once I have all four of the arbors in here. So why do I love this bean arbor so much? Well, for one thing, it's plenty tall for the pole beans because they really grow a long way and it makes life easier if you give them proper support. Now those vines will go up and over this arbor and down the other side. It's amazing. Also, the majority of the beans will hang down on the inside. And so if you think in the summertime where all of this is covered with leaves, it's a nice shady spot to stand while I'm harvesting all of the beans. I like how I'm taking advantage of this pathway, which is generally not what you'd call space that you would use in a garden. And because I'm doing it this way, the majority of the rest of these two raised beds is available for planting other things. Now what I usually do on the north side of the trellis is I plant celery. I think it benefits from a little bit of shade. Not a lot, but a little bit. And then on this side, I haven't decided what I'm growing yet, but usually I put in a nice patch of basil. I might put in a squash plant or two. But I've got all of this extra room to grow things in. So this is a great way to grow pole beans. And it's very sturdy. It's made from powder coated steel. It's going to last me forever. In addition to supporting things like pole beans and other types of vining vegetables such as squash, melons, and cucumbers, tomatoes are a plant that really benefit from having support. For one thing, if you have them off the ground, they won't be in contact with the soil where there might be plant pathogens. You don't want your plants to get disease if you can avoid it. Also, when they're up off of the ground, they're getting better air circulation, they're getting hit by more sunlight, and so that's going to help them ripen the tomatoes. That's very important. Now, when you're looking for a plant support, 
do not buy one of those small three-tiered flimsy tomato cages. They are not worth the money even if they're cheap. So what will happen is your plant will grow to a certain size. It might become a little bit top heavy and it will flop over before you know it. And so it is just not worth the money. The good news is that garden centers started carrying stronger and a bit taller three ring tomato cages. And so that would work. But you always want to attach the cage to some type of a stake and really hammer that stake into the ground tie the cage firmly to the stake and that will make all the difference. However, tomatoes do grow quite tall and so it's really nice to have a pretty tall support for them. This might be a little hard to see but I wanted to show you a type of tomato cage that we made years ago and it worked really well for us. And then I'll show you the method that I really like to use now. But this is a cage that we made from some leftover field fence. And field fence comes at 47 inches in height, so just under four feet tall. And that's a really nice size for a tomato plant. It gives it a lot of support. But even with something heavy duty like this, you still want to use some type of a stake and push it down into the ground really far so that's very firm. I would use a hammer and then I would tie the stake to the cage. This is so important. And we even put the stake on the side that the wind comes from just to be on the safe side. And that direction is southwest. That's where most of our winds come from. And so it works really well having this stake here supporting it. So it's pretty hard for a tomato plant to fall over when you've got something as heavy duty as this. What I like about field fence is that the openings are quite large so you can easily reach in either to prune a branch or to pick those wonderful tomatoes. So that has worked really well for us. And I used to put four tomato cages on the top of an eight foot long raised bed. So I crammed them in there, but it worked really well for me. Now let me show you what I use these days, and it has worked really, really well. I'm going to stand behind this support so you can better see what I'm talking about. Now I have used this method for supporting my tomato plants for quite a few years, ever since I interviewed an amazing vegetable gardener who was using this to support his tomato plants. And of course, we always emulate what works, right? So what you're looking at is a four foot tall by eight foot long sheet of concrete reinforcing wire. It's very inexpensive. And then it is supported by two heavy duty metal fence posts. And I have tied the wire grid with some jute twine. And I did that in a couple places so it doesn't come loose. Now, if you are growing indeterminate tomato plants, which can get very tall, you could do what this gentleman does specifically in his garden. He turns them the other way around so that they are eight feet tall, and he uses even taller fence posts to support it. But for me, even though I do grow indeterminates, we have a somewhat short growing season and I have a pruning regimen that I go through starting in August. And so the plants are never maybe more than about six feet tall. But this works really great. What I do is I plant my tomatoes and then I sort of weave the plants in and out of the grid as they grow. And I also use some twine to tie them to this grid so that they don't fall away from the support. This works really, really well. No more fussing with individual tomato cages. I just have this. I plant the tomatoes on either side of the grid. I can fit about five plants in a bed, which is one more than before. And so I really, really like it. Now I'm sure some of you are wondering about this red stuff on the bed. And so I figured I better answer that question before I move on. So this is known as SCRM mulch or red tomato mulch. And I heard about it years ago and decided to give it a try. What it does is it warms the soil and tomato plants really appreciate that. And it also reflects the right type of light up into the plants, which makes them more productive. And it does. 
But also over the years, it has really bothered me that I'm using plastic in my garden and I'm also advocating the use of plastic. The last thing any of us needs is more plastic in our lives, right? So I vowed that this year I would cut back on the amount I'm using. In fact, this is probably the only bed that I'm going to have any plastic on. But what I'm going to do this year is to experiment and see if I really think it is worth having in the garden. So I always grow three raised beds full of tomatoes and I'm just putting the plastic on one bed. Then I'm going to see how these plants produce compared to the ones that are going to be in these other two beds. So that's my goal. I think that's the only bed that I'm going to have plastic on this year. Usually I also use a green solar mulch to grow things like melons and winter squash, but I decided I'm just not going to use it this year. And I'm hoping to just completely stop using it, but I thought, well, just to be somewhat scientific, I'm going to put it on one bed, leave the other beds bare, and see if I notice a difference in the productivity. So I will keep you posted on that, but I just wanted to explain what this was all about. Now, while we're on the subject of growing tomatoes, I wanted to show you one more way that we have supported our plants. Last year, we had more tomato plants than we had raised beds. <laughs> and so we decided to use these large pots to grow three of them. And what we did is we had these supports from Gardener's Supply all we did was we carefully slid them on the outside of the containers so they weren't going to go anywhere and it gave much needed sturdy support to the plants so that worked really well for us too if you're in the market for some type of an artistic looking trellis be sure to go to your garden center to see what they offer. This is one that I bought a few years ago. It's made from powder coated steel, so it's going to last a long time. It's got a pretty design. I don't know if you can see it. And it has spikes on the bottom so you can push it down into the soil. But even so, I still recommend staking it. Now stakes can be kind of ugly. So what I have used in the past, and I try to sort of hide it as I support the structure, is three foot long pieces of rebar. That is a concrete heavy duty bar that works really well. And so what I'll do is I'll pound it down into the soil and sort of hide it behind the edges of this trellis. But it's a great way to grow vining vegetables, different types of flowers that grow in vines, and it really makes a nice addition to the garden. If you've been following me for a while, you know another thing I really like to use for plant supports is branches that we've pruned off of our fruit trees and other types of trees. Because for one thing, they look cool, and for another, it's free materials. So don't forget to do that. And if you don't have any branches laying around, I bet you you have a neighbor who has been doing some pruning and they'd be more than happy to let you have some of their branches. So I mainly have used these for my pea supports and I've used different methods for putting them together. So I was going to show you a few photos of the types of supports we've made. Right now, because we've been getting some frost at night, I have the structure that I made just recently all covered in floating row cover so it's not very beautiful right now. But take a look at these next photos so you can see the types of supports we've created for free. Okay, I hope this video gave you ideas for different ways to support your vegetable plants. Thanks so much for watching everybody. I'll see you next week. Now before I go, I want to remind you that I have a brand new book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, coming out on April 27. This is the guide that gardeners have been needing for ages, and I'm really pleased with how it turned out. In the first chapter, I write about all of the things you can do to keep your plants healthy and productive and better able to withstand pest attacks. 
The second chapter is all about the bugs. In it, you'll find a huge diagnostic chart where you go to the name of the crop that you're growing, read through the descriptions of the type of damage that crop might get, and that in turn points you to the different types of pests that could cause that damage. Then you go to the pest profiles where you'll see photos of those bugs, a description of them, what their life cycle is, the vegetable crops they're most commonly seen on, who their natural predators are, because that's really important information, and then a list of organic methods and products you can use to control those pests. There's also a chart on beneficial bugs because I wanted you to be able to recognize them in your garden since they do so much good for us. Also, who they prey on and how to attract more of them to your garden. The third chapter is about organic products and DIY projects. So the organic products have detailed descriptions that tell you when to use them, how they work, which insects they control, and if there are any cautionary bits of information that you should know. The DIY projects include traps and barriers, things like insect hotels to attract more beneficial bugs to your garden, a covered raised bed, and row cover hoops for floating row cover. So this is going to be such a great resource for you. Now, if you pre-order it before April 27th, you'll get my bonus content, Susan's top tips for growing the vegetables that everybody loves. All you have to do is email me your order confirmation. My email address is susan at susansinthegarden.com and I'll send you a link to it. But be sure to get your copy because you will be referring to it often. <music>